Welcome one, welcome all, I am Bridger, and this is Axis Empires in all its glory. It is a tabletop war game that is like few others that I have played. Have you ever wanted to play Hearts of Iron, but like, why bother getting a computer involved when I can just do it all with my head? Yeah, me neither, but here we are. So this is, as I said, a tabletop war game covering World War II, and it is massive. We're going to try to explain it to you as we go. And to start with, let's talk about how you win. The Axis versus the Allies, of course. Nominally, this is played uh, either as a one-map scenario or as a two-map combined game. In the one-map games, you play with three players, the Soviet faction, the Western Allies, and the Axis faction. Meanwhile, of course, on the Pacific map, you would do the same thing. And in a combined game, you play with three to six players. I'm going to do it all by myself, so let's see how that goes. This game is played over a series of turns that take place, and we'll actually pull it up right here. Uh, nope, there we go. Uh, this is the turn track. You see we can start in the spring season of 1937, and it will usually go till 1945 or sometimes 1946, depending upon the actual choices made during the game. Each year is uh, divided into nine turns. The summer season is a little bit longer than the others, being uh, three turns long instead of two turns long. You can see them divided by color here. It also shows weather on here, which gets a little bit crazier in the Pacific, but we're going to ignore that for now. And in each of those turns, you follow through this sequence of play roughly six times. <laughs> so uh, the European axis do this, then the, ja then the Japanese will do this, then you'll have the Western Allies on the Europe map, then you'll have the Western Allies on the Pacific map, etc. But we're going to break that all down for you and go as fast as possible, which means we're probably going to make some mistakes. If you spot them, please let me know in the comments and I will attempt to fix them after the fact if possible. Otherwise, we're just going to roll with it. So how do you win this crazy game? Well, the Axis have a goal, which is to spread out and expand as far as possible. What that means is capturing objective hexes. That are, these are the objective hexes here that are red for Soviet, or they are green for the Western allies. You can see some examples of them here. There's another one hiding up in Oslo. There's some down in the Middle East here. Uh, and these objective hexes that are green or red are things that the Axis must capture to score points. Meanwhile, all of the gray hexes that you see on the board count as negative points if the Allies can get control of those. So if, for example, the Axis has a total of four of these red and green objective hexes and the Allies have one gray hex, that would be four minus one for a total score of plus three. We then take that value, which is known as the strategic value, and adjust the victory points here as listed. So plus three means that we are in the one VP column and then we would be on the axis side, meaning that axis tied side, which means that in on this map, the axis would get have one victory point at that particular moment. Uh, the main goal of capturing all of these is because at some point in the game, the Axis player is going to essentially peg their maximum control, their, their high tide mark. They're going to expand as far as possible and say, I can't get any bigger than this. I'm just going to lock in the points that I've got now. It is then on the allies to attempt to beat that score. So for example, the historical example is that the Axis managed to get to exactly eight strategic value. They had four hexes in Russia, Minsk, Kiev, Sevastopol, and Rostov, and they had four hexes in the West. They had Paris, London, Oslo, and Athens. If they had managed to get just one more, it would have put them at three VP. Instead, they locked in their maximum value at two. Three is possible, but difficult. Four is nearly impossible unless the Allies have made some huge mistakes. Then from that point forward, as the Allies get stronger and stronger, the Axis are slowly going to get pushed back and pushed back. And eventually the Allies are going to start not only recapturing their own uh, objective hexes, but also they're going to start taking all these gray ones, which again adds negative victory points or negative strategic value. And so eventually the allies wound up having somewhere in the 13 to negative 13 to negative 16 range. The historical outcome was two for the axis and four for the allies. 
So that is the overall goal of the game that is taking place on both maps. And then we check at the score at the end. Uh, we compare the different maps together and there's a sequence to determine who actually wins. So that having been said, What's the state of the world at this point when the war starts? Well, the state of the world is that almost all the countries on it are neutral. If you see these little flags, here's the Belgium-Holland flag, Poland, Hungary. All of these flags indicate neutral nations. Uh, neutral nations will not have any units deployed on the board, whereas the uh, nations that are currently active do have units on the board. You can see, of course, Japan and Nationalist China and Communist China start active over here on the Pacific map. And the uh, the Russians obviously do too. All the major powers will start active. Uh, even the U.S. is technically active, although it is not involved in the war at the beginning. Uh, and then over on the uh, European map, we have Great Britain, Germany, Russia, and France all start as active. Uh, France actually is a minor country, one of the few uh, minor countries that starts active in the game. And that status matters for a couple of different reasons that we won't get into right now. So you'll see right now, there's not much in the way of units anywhere on the board here. The, the Russians got a couple. They, they start with these, uh, let's probably the biggest army in the game, maybe short of Japan, because uh, they start with eight steps of infantry. When I say steps, for those of you not familiar with the war game parlance, this little dot in the corner indicates that this is a one-step unit. If you take two one-step units uh, and they're in the same hex at the beginning of a turn, you can combine them into a two-step unit. In this case, you do that by flipping over this one and sending this one back to the force pool. And now you have a two-step unit that is greater than the sum of its parts. We took two units that had attack, defense, and move values of 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, and turned them into a 3, 3, 2. So that is how uh, the units are categorized. Different factions uh, will combine their units differently. This is how the Russians do it, but the West and the Germans have different ways of doing it, which we'll see as we play. So that's the state of the world in spring of 1937. Uh, we are going to quickly go over what randomized elements of the scenario were set up. We have uh, the, uh, uh, certainly uh, Spain is one of those. Spain is a civil war country at the beginning of this scenario. And at the beginning of the game, you flip a coin, roll a die, 50-50 chance to determine which of the two allied factions is supporting the Spanish Republicans. In this case, it could have been the Soviets or the West but the Soviets were rolled. So the Soviets are going to be the ones trying to support the Republicans against the nationalists. For Germany, it is very valuable to have the nationalists win that civil war. Uh, whereas if the allies manage to help the Republicans win the civil war, it can be detrimental. So we'll uh, see how that plays out. In addition, on this map, the Japanese have to contend with the Navy and the army fighting over control of the government. So at the beginning of the game, you flip a coin, roll a die, and a 50-50 chance the army or the navy is leading the government. In this case, the navy is leading the government, which has significant impacts over what cards can be played. But for now, we are going to go into our strategy for each of the different factions. I have done my best to sort of compartmentalize my brain and try to come up with various strategies without knowing what the other one is doing. So let's see how Germany starts the game. Uh, oh, quick note, we've got a couple other uh, pieces of housekeeping to discuss. Uh, we're going to be playing with a couple of optional rules. One of them is Fortunes of War. We're going to be drawing those Fortune of War cards because those are kind of cool. We're going to be playing with Luck, though it's my own version of Luck, where each of the factions gets a, uh, a Luck marker. And when they use it, then they get to throw it in the delay box and it'll come back on their side. They don't get to essentially... Uh, it doesn't get swapped over to the other side. I just like it, the idea of each faction on each map having a luck marker that they can sometimes call on to force a reroll. We're not using any of these others. I mean, garrisons we're using, but only because we're not going to play with the gamey nonsense that creates that be necessary. Uh, we're not worried about East Africa because that's just extra rules wait for me when I'm trying to run four, six different sides. We will use Soviet volunteers in, in, in Total Creek, but it doesn't matter. So we're, we're going to jump back in here 
uh, and get started with the German strategy. Now, one of the interesting things about this game is that there are three different war states and this it's tracked per map. So Europe has its own war state display up here and the Pacific has their own war state display over here. In limited war, each faction can only play the blue limited war cards and nobody's at war. You can't really fight. As soon as war breaks out, we enter limited war. And at that point, everybody on that map can play the black cards. And it generally means that the Axis is only at war with one side. They're either at war with Russia or at war with the West. And then when total war breaks out is when Germany goes to war with the other side that they weren't already at war with. So they're going to have a two front war eventually. And at total war, everybody has access to their most powerful cards. The same thing is true on the Japanese uh, Pacific map here. Japan is going to try to start the war against like one entity, whether it's China or Russia or Britain hopefully not more than two of those entities, and eventually uh, that, that will trigger limited war, and eventually they will need to go to total war because the U.S. is going to enter the war no matter what, and they have to choose and try to make it happen on their own terms. Now, Germany has these pre-war cards available to them, and you play a card at the beginning of each seasonal phase, uh, each seasonal turn. So if you recall, we were looking at the turn track here. Each of these uh, turns that has a red box is a seasonal turn. We flip over a new card and resolve it on those turns. So it's four cards per year. And that's how we're going to be planning out our strategy. Now, you remember that the, uh, the, the summer turns, uh, there are three of them, which means any card that you play in the summer that has extra effects that trigger every turn is 50% more effective if played in the summer. So if you have a card that gives you two steps every turn and you play it in the summer, you get six steps instead of four that you would play in any other season. That is going to be a defining part of the strategy for how we play here, which the nor which leads to the normal result. The normal historical play at the beginning of the game looks like this. Uh, we would then have German rearmament and we're seven. There it is, military purchase. Now, the reason that we normally play it like this is because these cards all have prerequisites. Military purges must be played after card number two has been played. Card number two has to be played after card number one. And you want to play card number one in the summer. By the way, this is I'm organizing this spring, summer, fall, winter. You want to play Goring Works established in the summer because you would get an extra step, a, a larger size military. Here's the thing. What I actually want in summer of 1937 is more roles supporting the Spanish Civil War because unlike a normal setup, the normal historical setup, I believe played three different support nationalist cards in order to win the Spanish Civil War. I'm really hoping to do it with one or two. Uh, and I've got a little up my sleeve to make that work. But that means that we're going to roll in this political events segment three times and possibly help the nationalists win. Uh, and You'll notice that a lot of these option cards have a red box. The stuff in the red box only happens on those seasonal turns, and it doesn't happen. So everything outside the box is what happens multiple times, uh, an extra turn on summer. So this is our first year. We're going to establish the Goring Works, which is going to lose us a step because we're not doing it in the summer, but we're going to gain an extra role on the Civil War table there. We're going to rearm Germany, giving them a bunch of extra stuff in their force pool. And then we're going to purge the military. Got to be done. Then what we're we going to do, the, the historical next year is, I believe, the Anschluss of Austria. Yeah, spring of 938 is normally demand Austria, where they Anschluss Austria. We're not going to do that. We're going to go by a different track here. We're going to go with Demand Denmark. This is an attempt to annex Denmark into Germany. And it's not a normal uh, start. So we're going we're gonna to have some fun playing it. You know what else we're going to play? Ribbentrop Diplomacy in the summer. People don't like to mess with these cards because they've only got a 33% chance of doing anything. Uh, I With luck rolls, you can kind of slightly improve those odds as long as your opponent doesn't counter you and force you to re-roll it themselves. Uh, but 
I've got a plan. I want to try a diplomatic Germany, which is very rare. You kind of see it a little bit, but I'm going to really maximize it and see how well we can do min max this. Then what am I going to do next? It's crazy. It's never been done before. It's demand Switzerland. Yep, that's it. This is the soonest you can play demand Switzerland. Uh, and it requires two other Ribbentrop diplomacy or demand cards having been played. And it can't be played directly after another demand card. So this is how the earliest we can do all of this because demand Denmark requires military purges. So the only way we could do this sooner is if we shifted everything up here and then we lose the ability to, to roll more times on Ribbentrop diplomacy and we lose the support nationalists, which I really don't want to do. So we're going to take this and put it like this. Now, why don't you normally want to do demand Switzerland? Well, these demand cards have a chance of two options. Country resists or ceded land. Ceded land is they give in. That's the historical result of the Anschluss. They, they gave in and said, fine, take Austria. We don't want a big war destroying our towns, etc. But country resists can have different effects depending upon the current state of the world. If the allies have not gotten their act together and provided guarantees for the miners, country resists is actually not that bad a result. It's just, it rolls on a table that might result in, in getting it anyway. But if the allies have guaranteed the sovereignty of the minor nations under their power, then it starts World War II. So normally demand Switzerland is a very dangerous card because if you'll notice, the die rolls for country resist are quite large. And so you normally wouldn't play it unless you're ready to start the war. I'm going to take a risk here and play it because normally you don't see people play guarantees in the first opportunity. This is the first moment when guarantees can be played. And that's what triggers the possibility of World War II breaking out. I think the Allies are going to play it here or here. The historical play is here in spring of 39. But I am going to take a risk and hope that they don't play guarantees because that means demand Switzerland cannot result in the start of World War II. Then we definitely want to play continuing rearmament. These rearmament cards provide significant and valuable forces in our force pool to build. And we can only use one of these rearmament cards a year. That's the symbol in the upper right corner showing us that that's a rearmament card. So we absolutely need to squeeze a rearmament card in every year because these provide you with all the powerful offensive forces. If you don't get these, then World War II is going to be very short. So we're going to squeeze that in at the end of that year. Then we're going to play an, our, our other Ribbentrop Diplomacy card. And then we're going to play Pact of Steel. This is the historical period when you would play Nazi-Soviet Pact to try to get the Soviets to bow out of the war for a while and let you mess with the Allies while they're, you know, doing their thing. Meanwhile... Uh, we're going to demand Austria last because my hope is even though I know at this point the war could definitely start, you can see Austria requires a one in order to trigger country resists. So my hope is that this doesn't start a war, but if it does, I'll be ready. This is September of 1939. So this will, if it starts the war, would start it on the normal schedule. And after that, we could maybe use another support nationalist. This spot here is open. It could be, uh, it can't really be any of these demand cards. It can't be not Soviet pack because those are going to get disc discarded. And then, actually, I'm sorry, it can't be support nationalist. We got to put German mobilization in there. Uh, it's got to sneak in there at some point. And that will give us the last grouping of really good offensive units that we need, including our two panzer armies. So support nationalists is just on the back burner there. And my hope is... We'll do very well here, not guaranteed, but we do have, if we roll a five on any of these Ribbentrop diplomacy rolls, Germany supports nationalists, that will let us roll again on the Civil War table. So if this doesn't get us quite there, I'm really hoping that this and this will give us maybe one or two more rolls on that Civil War table. There's a decent chance of us getting at least one extra roll. And then we'll have to win the Civil War in a different way because... At this point, the real war has started, potentially, and we're we're in trouble. So that's Germany's strategy. It's a very interesting diplomatic one. Why demand Switzerland? Because I would very much like to get both of the mountain armies and use them both, one for Sweden and one for Finland. Each of Sweden and Finland have these uh, ski steps, and the ski steps can be combined with the mountain army to build a really cool like multinational army that can fight up there 
in the north. And that would be a fun thing to threaten St uh, Leningrad with from the north. Normally, Leningrad, very, very difficult to take in part because there is this river that flows that makes it very difficult to attack without attacking across a river. If the Finns help us out and attack it from the north, then we've uh, made it easier on ourselves. So that's part of Germany's plan. Now, let's jump over to our Japan. And I forgot, I've got these little uh, tinted sides that you can see who we're focusing on in any given moment. Let's jump over to Japan. Uh, oh, the wrong one. Bingo, Japan. So Japan has an interesting situation at the start of the war. They, unlike Germany, they cannot depend on two years of peace. They have what's known as, and I'm going to pull it up here so I try to pronounce it at least somewhat right, uh, Gekokujo? Gekokujo. And that is, as the rule book describes it, a leg legitimized form of insubordination that included political and military assassinations, as well as just, well, I'm going to start a war and we'll let the people upstairs deal with it. I don't care. I, and that's just how they kind of worked. That's how they got into many of their conflicts throughout the years here. So that is a threat that's hanging over us at all times here on the, uh, with Japan on, on this map, because Many of the cards that both the Allies play and that Japan may be forced to play can potentially trigger a war when Japan isn't ready for it, when they don't want it. So we'll have to be ready for it anyway. So with that in mind, how do we plan to navigate this sea? Well, glad you asked. Here's the plan. We're going to start with uh, one of these program cards. We have army program, economic program, navy program, and political program. These represent four of the different paths that we can take through Japan's uh, strategic uh, planning. However, we only ever get to play two of them. If you look, every single program card says remove one program card. So by the time we've played army program and navy program, for example, those are the historical card plays, we will have to have discarded economic and political. So we only get two. I'm going to start with this one here. Oh, so what do these different economic, uh, different program cards do? Well, there is, let me see if we can pull it up here. The bada bing, bada boom. So there are a few different elements. Immediately provides access to a logistics marker. This can be placed in any city that Japan has a unit in that can trace a line of supply back to Japan itself. And what it does is it makes that city act as a replacement location. So instead of building new units fresh here over in Japan and then having to ship them out to wherever the war is taking place, the logistics marker lets us build them immediately either in uh, on the Chinese mainland or maybe down here in Malaya or over in Papua New Guinea. Wherever we think we need the troops, we can drop that logistics marker as long as there's a line of supply. The other programs, Army program gives us an Air Force unit, which is very valuable. A Navy program gives us a surface fleet, which is very valuable. And the political program gives us a couple of colonial units, which we can't really use until we start conquering areas. And uh, it has the Quit India marker. That represents Japanese incitement of uprisings in India that caused the British some headaches. Now, all four of these programs will always trigger when we hit total war, but we can trigger up to two of them early during limited war. That's what we're looking at right now with this decision. Which of these programs do we want to trigger early? Because that will determine which of these expansion cards we can play. There are uh, only going to be two of these played, and they can only be played after those various uh, programs have been uh, occurring. So if we want to play, you know, army expansions in limited war, then we have to play the army program. If we want to play economic expansion in limited war, we have to play the economic program. Otherwise, if we wanted to play economic program and political program, and then later we wanted to use the army expansion cards, got to wait until total war. That's a no, that's a no go. So this is a sort of a long-term strategy we're planning here. Now, my plan is going to do this here. Again, we've got a rearmament card. This gives Japan much needed steps. If we take a look at their force pool at the beginning of the game, they don't have a lot to build. So the food shortages card is uh, one that normally causes you pain. If the economic program has not been played, you have to roll on this table that has bad outcomes on it, pretty much exclusively. And then 
you, in return, you'll get these units. Like they have to deal with these food shortages to try to recruit more possible forces. But because we're playing economic program, this effect is negated. We've been dealing with our economic problems and now we don't actually have food shortages. Beautiful. So now we want to do something crazy. We're going to try demanding Hainan. We have three demand cards here, and they're kind of similar to the German demand cards. If they're successful, we get some territory. If they fail, we might start World War II, depending upon the posture of the party that we're attacking. However, demand Hainan will absolutely start the war. Period. Full stop. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Uh, unlike these other ones, country resist might start the war. So we're picking demand high non. Now, we will not be able to play demand high non unless the Navy is leading the government. Unfortunately, economic program says if the government marker is in its holding box, place it in the delay box. So when we play economic program, we're throwing the, uh, the marker away. And then when it's in the delay box, it comes back between one and six turns from that point. At the end of the turn, we roll dice for all the cards and the markers in the delay box, and we put them that far forward on the turn track. So that's how that works. So this is either gonna be played here or here, depending upon that roll. Uh, that's the idea anyway. So we're gonna hope that it's gonna go here. Next, we have to think about what's played next. And what's played next really depends on whether or not this role causes a war with China or not. And so I've got two different plans here, which we will reveal once we get to, to this particular card. I don't want to really get the card ahead of the horse, but we'll see when we see. For now, we're just going to map up that first year and see how it goes from there. All right, so that's Japan. If, if we do fail at demand Hainan, we're only going to war with the nationalists here in Kiangsu. We're not going to war with other parts of China, probably, maybe. We'll see. Next up, we're going to take a look at the Western allies over in Europe. And they have a interesting start. They kind of have really only one major choice. Uh, they've got a couple other minor choices, but one major choice. Are they going to finish the Maginot Line? Or are they going to uh, just fortify Metz and instead focus on reforming the French military and being a more offensive powerhouse? And both of these cards have another card connected to them. So finishing the Maginot Line will give us the Gamlin Line later in Limited War. Whereas if we finish, uh, if we start the French military reforms, we get the French military expanded later in Limited War. At least we will if France still exists by the time these cards can be played. So in our example, we are going to go with building the Maginot Line and trying to make it a headache for Germany to get in uh, to France. And we're going to again consider starting from summer. So we know we, we know we want to play this early. So we're going to play that during a summer turn because it'll give the French an extra step of military units. That's good. We know we want to play a British rearmament card that year. So let's stick that in the fall. And we know that there's only one way to get British steps built in pre-war. If you examine these blue cards, every single one that gives you steps will give you French steps, except wartime mobilization and Chamberlain diplomacy. And this one can't happen unless Britain's at war. So we're going to play Chamberlain diplomacy. Churchill diplomacy becomes available later in the game when Churchill becomes elected. And it's much more effective than this one. Well, I say much more. It's about 18% more effective. Um, so we'll play this, except we can't play that yet. We have to play that after change of governments, huh? So that's going to require a little bit of a, an adjustment here. All right. So unfortunately, I think what that means, the historical play, by the way, would either would, would be uh, negotiations with Belgium. The problem with playing negotiations with Belgium early is that while this can get us influence in Belgium, it won't actually get Belgium to join the allies because we haven't provided guarantees yet. So the card is kind of, if you happen to roll influence twice on this card, it's kind of a waste, which is unfortunate. So instead... We're going to just move this over. We're going to shoot one French step in order to get an extra roll on Chamberlain Diplomacy. It is what it is. That's just how we're going to run, roll with it here. 
And then we've got French rearmament. We definitely want to fit into the next year somewhere. It doesn't have anything outside the red box, so we don't want to play it in summer. What do we want to play in summer? Probably Little Entente. Little Entente allows the Western faction to spread around a bunch of influence in Central Europe, hopefully before uh, the Axis really gets to try to take any of those countries that are in there. They might get Austria here. There's not a lot we can do about that, but Little Entente might put some influence in Hungary or Czechoslovakia, I believe. Um, what's the actual list here? Central Europe is Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary. If we can get any influence into those, that would be nice into potentially slowing down the, the, the Germans' plans. So that's going to go right there in summer. We could have also put Chamberlain Diplomacy again because you'll notice Chamberlain Diplomacy has a recyclable symbol in the top right corner, meaning after playing this card, it comes back in our hand and we can keep playing it over and over again. We're probably going to play it here in the winter to get an extra British step. Um, it's very valuable to get those early British steps because they are hard to come by. Even in limited war, you'll notice Britain gets, okay, one armor, one infantry step. Uh, here, Britain gets one armor, one infantry step. Here, Britain gets a colonial step each turn. You want to see what the Germans get in limited war, ladies and gentlemen? They get, uh, well, that's Barbaros, that doesn't count. Here's three and six. Here's one and four. Here's one and four. Here's one and two. Literally like seven, eight times or nine times as many steps in some cases, as the British. So every single British step that we can build that will help us guard the, uh, the British Isles and or Cairo uh, will be very valuable. So after Little Entente, we definitely want to play Western Guarantees. Now, this will put some pressure on the German player because they will need to watch out for World War II triggering after this has been played. This will allow us to support the minor, the Western miners and say, we will protect you if the, if the Germans are mean. So anything played after that will trigger it. It could be played here, but again, I, I kind of want to mess with the German diplomacy a little bit more, and let's see how that works. Meanwhile, we definitely want Maginot Line completed in here. Let's make sure we're, we're not breaking any rules. Okay, French are, are, this requires card three, card three, card three. So we played this in the correct order. Um, next, in the next year, it's... Not quite clear where we want to go. We definitely want, I think, French mobilization in the summer. We gave up a step here for France. We definitely don't want to give up uh, the, the two steps that we would lose if we played French mobilization outside of the summer. So we definitely want that there. Meanwhile, what else? Oh, yes. We want negotiations with Belgium somewhere in there. Um, I'm leaving a space here maybe for Chamberlain diplomacy. But we could also potentially put negotiations with Belgium there. It's just as easily easy to do that. And then British mobilization or wartime mobilization would happen sometime in 1940, very likely, depending upon what the Germans do. We are missing uh, these league cards, these Arab League, Balkan League, Scandinavian League. We could fit those in here as well into these two slots. Um, by this point, the war may have started, so there we might actually play some, some limited war cards. Here, we could definitely play one of these league cards, but they're kind of weak. They don't do a lot. Uh, they just throw a little bit of an influence at best. Very, very rarely might they activate a country to join the West right away. And if we mess around in the Balkans with Balkan League, then we might accidentally cancel out some Soviet influence. So that is something to consider. But I think that's the, the, the rest of what we're going to do here with the West on the Total Krieg, the European map. Now let's take a look at the situation that the Allies find themselves in over here on the Pacific map. So they have a much different experience here. In the early war, they are very limited on the Pacific map. Uh, a lot of these cards have to do with helping support the Chinese in various ways, the nationalist Chinese specifically, because the nationalist Chinese, these light blue ones, are controlled by the Western player, and the communist Chinese over here are controlled by the Soviet player. So uh, we know that we're going to start with a cyan agreement because it gives a high chance of a Chinese incident, which is actually very valuable because it gives uh, influence that can be added to a Chinese country, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it also gives you roles in the colonialism table if you don't get that. So we're going to start with the cyan agreement. That was actually the historical play. And then we're going to throw the cooling de declaration in there 
Um, this one actually has a chance of uh, influence as well. So these two together are ways that the, uh, the Chinese uh, countries of Sichuan and Yunnan and Hopei can be added to the Western faction, right? It's trying to pull these guys in to all join the nationalists and resisting the, the Japanese. Uh, that is kind of the main goal. And the problem is we cannot really plan beyond this point without knowing what's going on with Japan. There's a lot of different directions we could go. We could start going with a Commonwealth rearmament if we suspect a British attack. The League of Nations is a better choice if we suspect a uh, an attack against the, uh, if the, if the Chinese are at war. The American rearmament, probably not super good early on, but it's good to have it because uh, I can't imagine going to war with the U.S. In, <laughs> in limited war on purpose. It makes a lot of sense. Chang diplomacy, maybe. Churchill diplomacy, these are recyclables we could use those again and again. But that's about as far as we can plan with the Chinese. Lastly, we've got the Soviets. Uh, let's go ahead and check out their situation here. Um, so as, well, oh, oh, uh, uh, boop, boop, uh, there we go. Over here, we've got Russia. And Russia has obviously some concern about what's coming for them from the east, or sorry, from the west. So they have options to demand areas just like Germany does. They can demand the Baltic states. They can demand the Finnish frontier. You see these little dotted white lines. Those represent areas that can be shorn off and become different things. So the uh, Bessarabia here can be stolen from Romania uh, by Russia. Eastern Poland can be stolen by Russia, etc. There are many different effects that can cause that. So what are we going to do? They choose three different paths, military purges, Tukhachevsky reforms, and Stalin line constructed. And these three cards, if they choose A, then they'll also get card 4A. If they choose 1B, they're going to get 4B and 1C and 4C. At the same time, card 27, A, B, and C also reflects the choice made at the beginning of the game. So the choice we make here is going to reverberate throughout the rest of the game. Military purges is the classic historical choice, and this one allows us to get nothing. We get nothing. There's no steps here. There's no toys. Russian mobilization on 4A doesn't really give us much. It gives us three steps. That's not much. And uh, so that's just kind of boring. But... Way over here, it gives us the best possible card 27. Just when you need it, it dumps 13 steps into your uh, in, 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 onto the map to help you out. Uh, and this has a table that represents sort of internal political strife between Stalin and the other people in his cabinet. Uh, not really a coup, but could be a kind of, kind, of, kind of a coup. But you'll notice that a lot of these results... Uh, say purges, no result, especially uh, number six. Number six is more likely to come up because there will be DRMs added to things that'll most likely make sixes come up. Uh, and what that means is great patriotic war can result in a few bad things, but generally speaking, it's not going to be that bad. And you get a bunch of steps. So this is the best possible card 27A. So you get barely anything here at the beginning, but you get a very good card 27 later in Total War because you got rid of all the all the people that weren't going that were going to potentially form a coup. Meanwhile, Tukhachevsky reforms gives you really good stuff. It gives you an extra headquarters unit, which is fantastic. It gives you two armor unit armor steps and four infantry steps. That's fantastic. Then on Russian mobilization, it gives you basically the same thing as as uh, oh sorry, your red armor mobilization. It gives you some mech steps that are better than regular uh, armor steps that for the Russians. So that's also good. You get some great early toys with Tukhachevsky reforms. And even later on card 27B, you get some of the strong, no, sorry, the strongest Russian units that are possible because you reformed the Russian army to try to improve quality over quantity. So you get some really good mechanized units that resemble what the West builds later in the game. However, this has the worst possible table for internal strife on it. And coup attempt is really bad. And not only that, you get a paltry five steps compared to the 13 that we got from Great Patriotic War. So whereas uh, Military Purges gives you jack at the beginning and gives you a pretty decent option later on, Tukhachevsky Reforms gives you really good toys early and then kind of guts you later with the Red Army Conspiracy card. 
And then Stalin line is kind of in the middle. Stalin line doesn't give you a ton of steps, but it does give you sweet, sweet fortresses. Have you ever wanted to build the Maginot line, but for Russia? There you go. This guy can be built on the Polish border and you get a ton of forts. I think eight forts plus another fort for Kiev that can make it really frustrating for the Germans to come through. And then later in the game, you get a kind of middle road between these two. It's got uh, only four steps, but the actual results of the political events table are not that bad. And it gives you an extra headquarters when you get here. So that's kind of the, the choice that we're making. What we've chosen to do this time is we're going to go with Tukhachevsky reforms because I've never done it before and I want to see how it plays out. I want to get those really cool toys that the Russians never normally get to play with. So we're going to play that first. Then we want to support Republicans. I would, I would like to see if we can get the Soviets to try to win the Spanish Civil War. Uh, I want that to be uh, something that messes with the, with the Germans for the rest of the game. Now, the support Republicans card is slightly weaker than the uh, Germans version where they support the nationalists, but it is what it is. After that, we kind of have to choose a card five because of the ways that this works. So we're going to choose political purges. That is the historical uh, option where we are going for a mean Stalin that is going to use military might to intimidate his neighbors and demand that they bow to his will and give up the Baltic states, annex the Baltic states, annex pieces of Finland, etc. So the alternative to that collective security is imagining a kinder, gentler Stalin that tries to convince its neighbors to join the common turn and fight against the, the, the fascist menace. But we're not going to play that way. We're going to play with the political purges. That's the historical option. Next, we get new five-year plan. Uh, kind of has to be played early because a lot of cards depend on this having been played. And I mean, we could play that in the summer, but I don't think we're going to want to wait because Russian rearmament requires the new five-year plan. And we don't want to push Russian rearmament way back here. I'm going to move these out of the way. We don't want to push Russian rearmament way back over here. We want that in the spring so that we can unlock some other options. Eastern Bloc is going to be next in the summer. That gives us some decent options for diplomatic success to drop some influence in various places. Then this is the point where I usually try to weave in a Forces for the Far East card because if you don't play this card, the Far East Russians get very, very few steps to build. And if they never build any extra steps here in the Far East, Japan will be real tempted to go against Russia instead of against Britain. Historically, they neutralized Russia. They signed a non-aggression pact with Russia and they fought against Britain and the United States. In this hypothetical, Japan is allowed to neutralize Britain, signed a non-aggression pact with Britain, who's happy to do so because they're in a fight for their life at the, at the time that, that it would be signed in 1940-41. Um, and then they go after Russia instead. Now, the Americans eventually come in, so they're fighting Russia and America instead of Britain and America. So you're always fighting two of those big powers. But again, if you don't bring some steps over here, you're basically asking Japan to attack you instead of the British. So that's why we're going to try to fit uh, forces for the Far East in there. Then probably continuing rearmament. We definitely want to weave that in the next year. And it would be great to get this in the summer, but we have another option for summer. The Nazi Soviet pact would give us three steps as well. And it gives us a chance to roll ally support resistance, which is a nice thing to have uh, early on in the game. So we're going to go with that. That's as far as I've gotten here. Uh, remember, support Republicans is a recyclable. So we could also put support Republicans here and we could put support Republicans here. Those are all options. Now, a lot of these cards, by the way, are getting discarded. Russia starts with one of the largest decks and then discards a ton of cards. Like, just look at this list of cards that has to be removed uh, when you play Stalin Line Constructed. And then more of them get removed by political purges. So we're going to have limited options. That's why we have these holes here. So that is Russia. Russia is done. What about Eastern Russia? Eastern Russia has even more limited options, but their main one is, do they want to make an ally out of Mongolia? Or do they want to build their own version of the Stalin line, but over here on the east? And unfortunately, unlike the Stalin line, the eastern line only gives you two fortifications instead of eight. 
It would be really nice if it gave a third, but that's the way that it is. If you choose the Eastern line, I imagine it would be built here to protect the rail line that goes back to Irkutsk and these other two uh, strategic hexes. And then the other one might be built here in Chita. Um, alternately, actually, I'm sorry, it can't be built back there. It have to be built here. And this is actually a good spot for it because you got the rivers. So if you can manage to put something here to guard that river as well, then you're in decent shape. Vladivostok already has a fort. You might consider, one should almost always be here guarding Irkutsk. The other option is you could put a fort here in, um, damn, I can't remember what this is, Karborovsk uh, here. That is another good spot for the other line, uh, other Eastern line fortress. However, we're not going to go with that path because one of the disadvantages of that path is, yes, you get a fort here, you get a fort here. It stymies the Japanese a little bit, but they will eventually take it down. And more importantly, the Mongolians are not part of your alliance at that point. If you do not choose the Mongolian purge option, which uh, is listed over here, Mongol purges, then the Mongolians will not be part of your alliance. It means Japan can attack Mongolia, conquer it, and then start the war against Russia right on your doorstep going towards Irkutsk. So that's a difficult choice to make. Do you get the Mongolians on your side, despite the fact that they have uh, two units to build? But that means that you can forward deploy your forces inside of Mongolia, more or less. Um, unless you're a pack. Oh, no. If they're the same policy, then yeah. You, so if you do Mongol purges, you can kind of forward deploy the Russians along this border, giving you the ability to trade time for space as you fall back towards Irkutsk. So they're both interesting options. I don't necessarily think that one is better than the other, but we're going to go with Mongol purges. That's just what we're going to do. Then we're going to throw a new five-year plan there in the summer because, as you can see, it gives us multiple roles in that political table. Um, and we don't quite know what we're going to do after that, but we definitely want to put... Russian rearmament, we can't put on the same turn that we, on the same year that we put Mongol purges. Uh, I think then we probably want to put it here. Then we definitely want pact with China in the summer because that's got some other very good political roles for us. More importantly, the sooner that we can get this, the better because it uh, upgrades our communist allies in Kansu. It gives them additional forces to fight the Japanese with. And it, if they're uh, you know, under attack, that's a good thing to do. The next one we want to consider is the Lan Chao Agreement. This one gives us a chance to trigger Chinese incident events, which can be helpful to us. And then probably Asian diplomacy the summer after that, because it, again, allows us to play influence actions, which allow us to get other countries to join our faction, including, but not limited to, Xinjiang over here. So those are probably the only things we really know, but we definitely want to put continuing rearmament over here. Um, maybe here. Yeah, might be better to put the continuing rearmaments over here. Or in the winter? That way we can space them out. Yeah, probably better in the winter. And then Russian mobilization could happen somewhere down in this year. So these aren't fully fleshed out, but you can see there's not a lot of options for the Russians. They'll eventually get some more stuff they can do during limited war, but this is really all they get. All of these cards that say war progress, this represents the progress of the war in Europe. We cannot start playing these cards until the European war has begun, total war specifically. And then we can start playing these cards one per year and they unlock new cards that say, uh, card 9 War Progress 4 has to have been played before you can play Demand East Turkestan. So they're very limited here on the East, but that's why I normally played as a single country, a single player would play both the East and the normal Russians. So that's our plan. Rule the world. You and me. Anyways. All right, it's good time to set up the initial forces. The Chinese nationalists are deploying along the North here to try to... They're, they're anticipating a historical... Boom, smash through Hopei and then come south and try to grab Peping and Wuhan very quickly. Uh, but they're open to adjusting that because obviously the Japanese are also right here in Shanghai and they're also over in Formosa. They can walk over to Fuchao. So entirely possible for them to come in from that direction if they're not careful. They do at least have something demanding that, defending Nanking. And to be honest, I think this is better left in Nanking. Um, although flip it around, I'd say probably doing this because the nationalists do want to protect that capital city from an attack through Shanghai. 
Although they also want to be in position if Hope is attacked, they want to be able to go up there and defend it. But I think this is probably a better distribution for the nationalist Chinese. Meanwhile, I didn't mention it, but the Kwangtung army up here is considered Japanese as far as nationality is concerned, but it has special rules. It's not allowed to leave the borders of Manchukuo. It can attack out of, but it cannot leave Manchukuo unless Japan is at war with both Chinese factions and Russia. Essentially, they are have to be left in defending Manchukuo against a potential attack if any of those factions are neutral. After that, they're released. So they are kind of helping you take Pei Ping and then they're done. That's all they can do, which is why I'm leaving a, a, a unit up here that can potentially stack with them. Uh, maybe this is a... It's hard to say where this unit should be, actually. I think it should be here. That's probably better. Yeah. We'll put that unit there and then figure things out later. All right. So uh, I think that's it for Japan. I think we're ready to begin. Only 50 minutes in to do the intro and the strategy discussions. That having been said, all the factions are now going to need to pre-plan their, uh, their cards. And so we flip. And then we are going to be going for Germany first. So I'll put the German thing on flip pending, flip pending, and we're going to be ready to go here. So I hope you guys are interested. There's chapter icons at the bottom that tell you what the different turns are, but we're going to be starting right now with the first turn, spring, uh, March, April, spring of 1937. So J the first thing that happens if we look at this, uh, this sequence is we do a seasonal victory point check. So at the beginning of the game, the uh, Germans have no control over any uh, Soviet or Western hexes, and the Allies do have technically control over this gray hex here, Metz, but they are a policy-affected country which is just a complicated mess I don't really want to describe. But in very brief, these represents the policies towards Germany or Japan on the other map. And uh, the policies themselves, if they are ever ended, trigger war. So these are essentially peace policies, things that are ways that they convince themselves they should stay peaceful against Germany. If a policy is ended, all versions of that policy are ended. So right now, because France and Great Britain under the appeasement policy, that represents a military alliance. If that policy is ended, it's ended for both of them and they both go to war. Critically, the Western miners are not under the same policy as Great Britain and France. That is why they want to play Western guarantees as soon as they can. To, well, not necessarily as soon as they can, but at some point in order to get the Western miners under the same policy so that they can all go to war at the same time and prevent Germany from just bullying everybody in Europe. So what it means, though, is that any of these gray hexes that are controlled by a country that is under a policy, not at war, it doesn't count against Germany. So the current strategic value is zero to zero, which means we are at zero, which means we're at one VP on the Allied Crusade side. The same math occurs over here on the Pacific map, except we don't even have any gray hexes under allied control anywhere, not even policy affected countries. So let's go to the next step, the seasonal phase. We check our we, we check our old option card, flip our new one, perform the things on it, including replacements as well as shipbuilding. So that all having been said, let's go ahead and reveal Goring Works established. And at this point, the British are spilling their tea and going, boy! Jove, I can't believe they played that in the spring. Nobody does such a thing. Uh, and what that card tells us to do is force pool Germany eight armor steps that are two two fours get added to that force pool. So we've got the tray right here. We can pull this open, right click on these, say send to force pool. Done. Now, the next step is we've got to uh, get, get Germany's next card set up. So we're going to do that, send to pending. And... The next step after that is uh, replacements. They don't have any replacement steps in the option card segment. So we go straight to shipbuilding. Germany's going to roll its shipbuilding. And it is a three. Unfortunately, Germany requires... Uh, Germany requires... Oh, it's not here, actually. It is here. 
Germany requires a one in order to get a shipbuilding point. Japan requires a one to a three. The British require a one to the five. The Americans are also one to three and the French are one as well. So Germany missed their free shipbuilding point for this season. And the last thing that happens is they gain one step in the conditional events segment, which is way at the end of the turn here. Uh, however, we're just skipping over movement and combat because there's nothing for them to do. They're not at war yet. So they're going to gain one step from their force pool. And look at this. They have 32 one-step units here. So they're going to build one of those in Berlin. That's a nice place for it as any. And then they're done with their turn. So now we go over to the Axis uh, on the Pacific map, the Japanese, and they're going to reveal their card, make it the current card, and we then show that it is economic program. They must remove one program card and one imperial directive card. Oops, wrong one. We need to pull this up. We're going to get rid of the army program because both of our contingencies do not use it. We're either going to use the navy program or the political program as our second option, so we're discarding army program from our uh, our choices here. Now we have to get rid of one imperial directive. And this is just some really long-term planning. These are the five, one, three, four, five, six different plans that our military advisors have said, we could research these things and have them ready by later in the war. But which one do we want to use? We're gonna have to get rid of these and stop funding them as they, as they go here. We're gonna get rid of chemical weapons. Uh, I really think we're gonna keep naval projects and I-boat strategy and Wow, Fujiyama Bombers is a really interesting one as well, but we're not going to choose that just yet. So that all having been said, I believe that is the end of, oh, if the government archer is in its holding box, place it in the delay box. So we can certainly do that, send a delay box. And the last one, Axis gain one scratch convoy. Uh, Japan gets a scratch convoy from... Card four, right? Is that what I'm thinking here? Oops, wrong thing. Yeah, card four, economic program. So that goes to the delay box. Yes, goes to the delay box. Then Japan receives two steps from their force pool. And they have to be built in a city. Uh, and uh, Nagasaki is as good a place as any. So we will build those two steps here. Uh, we're not overstacking because these are... Uh, these are... LBA, land-based air units. I'm just going to move them out of the way, though, just so that it's easier visually to see what's going on here. Um, and those two units have been built in that city. Now Japan has to roll their shipbuilding. Come on. Yes, they got a two. That is between one and three. Japan now gets to go to the great menu and choose which ship type they want to build. They could choose a battleship. They could choose a full carrier. Or they could choose two light ships, meaning a light carrier and or light uh, sort of heavy cruisers. But battleships take the longest to build. So I think the very first ship we want to build is the Yamato. Bum, ba, ba, bum. So that's going into the shipyard delay box. We won't know exactly how long it's going to take to build until later. We're hoping for a low roll on that, but it could be an extra year depending upon the uh, complications that occur due to that particular uh, ship being constructed. So now uh, it says we are past the option card segment, except now we have to set up our next card. So let's go over to Japan here and flip this and make that our pending card. And now we are moving on to the support segment. We don't have any support units to place. These are things like air and naval units, which we're right now ignoring until we get to combat. Then we'll see how those work. Um, we are also going to go to the organization segment where we're going to break this unit down. Currently, it is a two-step unit. I'm looking at the top one, the 331. The fortress that's underneath here in Dairon, uh, it's just going to stay there forever. We're not going to get rid of that fortress. There's no real reason to. But we're going to break down this 331 into two one-step units instead of the two-step unit that it is now. So it's a two-step unit, converting it to a one, uh, two one-step units. And we'll bring out this one, I think. Yeah, sure. That's the one we'll bring out. So now there are two one-step units there. Now, because there's two one-step units here, we're threatening to go really quickly over to here and set up an attack on Hopei because one-step units can, can travel along rail lines twice as fast as they normally can. Uh, as, as normal multi-step units can. We're also kind of in a port, so we're threatening movement down south as well. And to that effect, 
we're going to open up this and place a troop convoy here in the Yellow Sea. Now, if you look closely, you see this Yellow Sea box is actually representing this area here. There's just not enough actual area to stick this box in it. So it, the box for it is down here, but it's representing this area over here. So now that we have that troop, uh, troop carrier down, I think we're now going to strongly consider moving a unit. Hmm. I think we want to move this unit down here, actually. Uh, no, we're going to move this unit down here. That spends our troop convoy. Each troop convoy can only carry a single one-step unit. And then we're done with all of our operational moves at this point, which brings us through combat, no combat. We're now in reserve movement phase, and the troop convoy can carry one more unit. We're going to send it down to Formosa through the same sea zone. And then we're in the conditional event segment where it says apply economic program. So that is doo -doo -doo, right over here. Economic program. This event can only work, uh, occur once per game. Uh, places marker in the delay box. So we're going to get access to that fairly soon. All right. So Japan looks to be done. Let's hop over to the Western allies. You always go Axis, then West, then Soviet, and you always start with the European map. So now it is the British over here on this map who are going to reveal their card, Change of Government. And that is a very boring card that does nothing but give France a couple of steps here. Uh, but they do have to pick their next card, which in this case is going to be Chamberlain Diplomacy. We're going to make that the pending card. And then we are going to carry out, what is France doing? Absolutely nothing, except they're gaining one new French step. But which French step? Well, let's have them build the colonial step down here. Colonial steps have to be built in specific locations. In this case, we're going to build it here in Algeria. That is a legal location for the colonial step. And then during the, uh, the French turn, we put out a convoy in the Western Med, and we have it spend its operational move to go up to here placing the convoy in the used box. And then during reserve movement, it can go one, two, three, four. Remember, it travels double on railroads. So operational movement, it crossed the, the med, and then in reserve movement, it crossed up here to help block the last hex that is being threatened by Germany. All right, that is now concluded for, I'm sorry, that was during the conditional events phase. They couldn't actually make that journey. Duh, that's not a normal replacement. The normal replacement step happens up here, whereas the conditional events happen way down here, which means that they can't move after being placed. So they'll have to make that journey next turn. All right. In the meantime, uh, the West has concluded their turn here uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in Europe. Now we're going to go over to the West here in the Pacific, and that is going to be revealed. The Cyan Agreement. Chang agrees to cooperate with the communists, or at least we hope so. Let's find out if it's effective, shall we? So there's no red box, which means we now have to uh, pick the next card, which remember was going to be the cooling declaration. And now we're going to roll a die. Now we're going to roll with what are called political die roll modifiers. And there is a little chart on here that tells us political DRMs, uh, is minus one for each victory point in the box labeled Allied Crusade. If you recall, we're on VP1 for the Allies at the beginning of the game. So this is a minus one to every single political role on this map. The same thing is true over on the Europe map. So let's roll it and see what happens. It's a four. Minus one to a three is Chinese inertia. No result. Bad news for the Allies over here, but they are basically going to be done. I don't think they want to move anything. At this point, uh, they're probably just going to stay right where they are. So that brings us to the Soviets over on the European map. They are going to be revealing their card, which is Tukhachevsky reforms. And uh, much to the surprise of the Germans, the Tukhachevsky reforms implies that the Russians reached out to the German military and did some trading and said, listen, you guys help us with uh, making our military better and we'll give you extra oil or coal or iron or whatever it was they needed. So that causes us to remove a ton of cards. I'm going to do that real quick. So what it actually has us do is that we skip over those other, we, we get rid of all the cards representing the other two paths that we didn't take. But the really disadvantaging thing here is when we play Tukhachevsky reforms, we have to get rid of Russian ultimatum. 
Russian ultimatum is the only way that Russia can force one of the only ways that Russia can force their way into the war during limited war. So if Germany pursues a long limited war, instead of launching Barbarossa in 1941, if Germany tries to go against the West for a longer period of time and keep Russia neutral, this is a card that lets Russia get in the war. But because we've been using the Tukhachevsky reforms, our military generals are cozy with their military generals and they don't really want to get involved in a war against the Germans. They don't see it as inevitable. Maybe we can be friends, they say. Well, that limits our options in the future. But Tukhachevsky is going to give us some really cool toys to play with. So we're going to see how that plays out. And the other thing that happens here is we get a new unit into our force pool. 1B, uh, actually we need to pull this up. Soviet 1B, that goes to directly to our force pool. Do not stop, do not pass go, do not collect $200. And then we get two armor steps and four infantry steps for replacements. Beautiful, we're gonna take them. Uh, so two armor steps, I'm gonna stack them here and here. Then just for easy clarity, I will stack one, two, three infantry over here and another infantry in Minsk. No, yeah, in Minsk, sure. No, let's put that one, yeah, in Minsk. No, up in Leningrad. There we go. Okay, so we've got our replacements. We now have to pick our next card and we know what that's gonna be. It's gonna be support Republicans. So we're gonna send that to the pending box and then we are going to move on to the shipbuilding segment. I think we've, yo, we did shipbuilding for Japan. That's right. Uh, so now oh, we didn't do shipbuilding for the West. That's what we didn't do. Here's Britain on one to five. They got it. France is one. Nope. Uh, America is one to three. They missed it as well. Oh, wow. So Britain is the only other one that gets to build any ships this turn. And for the similar reasons, I think they're going to build one more battleship uh, before we try building some more carriers. This is the King George V is going to be added to the build queue for Britain. So here's um, the Russian build uh, check for their Navy. They need a one. They got it. Oh boy. Another Russian battleship coming to the board. How effective is that going to be? Um, and now we get to choose where we build that additional Russian battleship. So they don't have any units over in the east at the moment. Do they even have any on the shipbuilding track? I think they might. That's not, uh, let's see. That's the Baltic Sea. This is the Black Sea. Yeah, I don't see any ships being built over there. Is it even bother worth bothering building any ships over here? I don't think so. I think we should just consider building more ships for the Baltic Fleet or the Black Fleet. And right now, the Russian... Baltic Fleet and Black Fleet look like this. This is the Baltic Fleet. It's got two battleships. And the Black Fleet have a single battleship. So maybe we should consider building a couple of light ships to go along with them. Because, let's see, the Russian battleships are very slow. Not that they need to be fast, though. So let's consider that. Uh, we have to pick carry, uh, cruiser number one. And I will also build another cruiser number one. There we go. So we've got one cruiser for the Black Fleet, one heavy cruiser for the Baltic Fleet, and Russia is done with that. So now we're moving on to the initial administrative phase. They're going to support, they're going to organize, they're going to combine. We're going to combine this guy, send this guy back to the force pool, combine this to the force pool, combine this to the force pool. And interestingly, we've got a cool option here. This is a Russian cavalry unit. And if you look at their force pool, you can see that there is a way to build a Russian cav mech army. If you take the cavalry step plus an armor step, you get a cav mech army. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go send that back to the force pool. And we've got a cav mech army here, kind of in reserve. And then we've got another cav mech army here, kind of in reserve. The last thing we're going to do in combining here on the Soviet side is, first we're going to put these steps over here and take our headquarters and put it on the map. Headquarters is a three-step unit, unlike the other units that we've seen so far that have a one-step side and a two-step side. The headquarters only has a two-step side and a three-step side. So in order to build it, you have to remove 
that many steps from the map and replace them with this guy. You cannot build him directly onto the map as a replacement. So we're going to remove these three units and replace it with a three-step headquarters. And what that will allow us to do is headquarters can participate in combat from up to two hexes away. So a headquarters here, for example, could support both of these spots uh, equally, not equally, one of these two spots each combat phase. And these could also have full stacks of units in them. So the other more important valuable piece of headquarters is A, they give a shift in combat, and B, they prevent retreats. Without a headquarters involved in combat, your units will probably retreat really far, allowing your enemy to take ground. So the that's the goal of the headquarters is to sort of stiffen the line and make sure that we don't allow any breakthroughs. So we built one of those early. We're going to get more steps to build on the front line here, but that is Russia's Tukhachevsky reforms. We're now going to move these units a little bit. We're going to move the, uh, the, the Kavmech forces to try to build a little bit of a escape route for our units should we need them or a counterattack force kind of right behind the front line here. Meanwhile, I'm also just going to block off this because there's something that everybody should be aware of. One-step units, we've talked about how they travel faster on rail, right? We saw that happen over here. The difference is the hexes on this map represent such long, like, double the, the distance compared to the hexes on the Europe map. That's why almost all the units on this map have a one-factor movement point. So it's defense factor, uh, sorry, attack factor, defense factor, movement factor. And so almost everything has a one here, whereas in Europe, it is important to know that the Germans get armor units that have a four movement factor, meaning they get to move eight distance in the operational movement phase. And then they could move another eight in the reserve movement phase, as long as all eight of those moves in both cases are along a rail line, which means they can declare war on the Baltic States, which has no military to speak of at the start when it gets declared on. And then they could just run right up through here and go right to Leningrad if it's not blocked. So we're gonna keep a blocking force up there for now. And that's a decent start. Um, keeping something in Odessa is not terrible, though I think maybe we move it up to here to block the rail connection in both cases and get it a little bit closer because now we can go one, one, two, three, four if we absolutely had to. So, uh, you know what? Maybe just move it up here. Yeah, we're going to move it here and get it closer to make, like, make a real line before we start blocking off Romania. We don't have to worry about Romania just yet. All right, last I switch over to the Russians here on the far east which I've chosen a nice little snowy blue, frozen blue color because the game doesn't really differentiate, doesn't have a good way of differentiating color between the two Russian factions. Whereas you can easily say, well, the European one is led by the British because they're most directly involved. And the Pacific one is led by the Americans because they're most directly involved. So you can use their colors. Russia is just brown on both maps. So I've, used, I've chosen the, uh, the, the, the vignette to be an ice blue. So over on that map, we flip this over, we send it to current, and it's the Mongol purges. We have to remove Eastern line, and then the Soviet minor postures have to change. So we go ahead and do that. Where's Eastern line? We discard that forever. And then the Soviet minor postures have to change. Uh, can we just grab this and clone it? No, of course not. Why wouldn't we be able to do that? All right, there we go. I have got Peace goes away and disputes get added. So now the Soviet miners and Russia have the same posture, meaning if the Mongols, are, if the Mongolia, if Mongolia is attacked by the Japanese, it will pull the Russians into the war. So they are now supported miners. Next, the Russians get two infantry steps, which is nice. This is like the only two infantry steps they get for a while, most of the time. So let's pull that up and see what we can give them. Well, oh, crap, not much. Uh, they're going to build this, uh, these two steps here, and then they have to choose the next card, which we decided was going to be five-year plans. We make that our pending card. And now they will only get that conditional event step if Russia's posture is war receive an extra step. It's not, so they're not going to get that. But I think they may want to... They may want to 
build this headquarters, take these two steps, center of the force pool and build the headquarters right here. It'll allow them to prevent this unit from retreating if it gets attacked and it will give an extra shift in combat. So it'll help really prevent a fast drive on Irkutsk if we're worried about that. These are gonna always fall. So I really would rather make sure Irkutsk becomes a fortress metaphorically and, and doesn't fall easily to the Japanese. So that's where we're gonna put that unit for now. And that's the end of the first turn, spring 1937. Uh, sorry, not quite the end. We do have to roll for the delay rolls and we have to roll for, uh, we have to move the turn track. So we move the turn track here. We're gonna move, well, actually turn track moves last. Sorry. Uh, so we do have uh, some delay rolls here in this box. And we're now gonna roll to see what we get for these options. Oh, geez, two, six, six. All right, well, the good news is the Navy marker's coming back by the summer, or the government marker, I should say. It could be on either side. But then our logistics and our troop convoy aren't coming back for six turns. One, two, three, four, five, six. Not until uh, way in the fall here. Um, so that was bad luck for us. I don't think we wanna waste our luck marker re-rolling that, to be honest. Then we go ahead and check the naval shipbuilding delay rolls here. We've got a couple to do. So Japan's going to roll, and Japan is going to add nine just for the amount of time it takes to build a ship, and then they're going to add two because it's a battleship. This is why we wanted to lay down the battleship first. The carriers have uh, plus nine. The battleships are at plus 11 to build. So here we go. Battleship, three plus 11 is 14. So four, eight, 12, 13, 14. So that is where the Japanese are going to be. All right, now rolling for Ching George, same thing, adding 11. So 15, 4, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15 is there for King George. And finally, we get the two uh, Russian ships in order, four and six. All right, four and six for Russia, it means they're going to get uh, 14 and 16 turns respectively here, because they only add plus one instead of plus two for a full battleship because they're building those lighter cruisers. And I think that's probably going to be it. Now that we've done the delay rolls, we now advance the turn track here and here, and we're ready for the next turn. And it's going to be much faster because non-seasonal turns are always faster. We get to ignore the whole card aspect unless it has something that carries over from turn to turn. So let's take a look at the situation here. Uh, starting with Germany again. Now, Germany has economic program, which has nothing outside the box that hasn't, oops, sorry, looking at the wrong thing, has going works established. So all that's going to happen is at the end of the conditional event segment, they're going to add one more unit to the map. And it's going to be one more infantry step. We'll put that in Berlin. And it doesn't really matter where it is right now because the war is not going to happen. So they're going to be done. And now we're going to go over to Japan. Japan has economic program that is, again, not going to trigger anything, but we're still going to move some stuff around as Japan. I'm still thinking about how we might do this. Um, I think I made an error. I'm going to go ahead and reverse what I did last time. And instead, now we're going to move these guys to here. Oh, no, I see how I want to do this. I see how I want to do this. Never mind. Never mind. All good. Um, keep it like the way that it was. And this time we're going to move this gentleman here with the first operational move. And then I don't think we're going to move anything for the other option. We're just going to hold still here and, and we'll move stuff again once we get these guys set up. Um, no, you know what? Let's, let's do this right. Last turn, let's pretend that I move both of these guys over here so that at, during the conventional event, uh, during the, um, uh, the co combination segment, that's one thing that's very interesting about this game. You have to prepare for next year's or next turn's organization segment on the current turn, right? So last turn, if I wanted to combine these guys here, I would have had to move them together. And I'm just going to go ahead and retcon that because uh, I realized that the thing that I wanted to do requires me to do it. So they combine. And that leaves room now to bring over this two-step guy, or sorry, two-strength two guy. And then the other guy's going to go down here to Formosa. So 
So that is, I think, where we're going to do our two moves for this turn. So now we've got six threatening Nan King, which is a decent number. And we've got one guy here that can potentially help build somebody else to attack and to walk into Fu Chao and try to threaten the southern part of Kiangsu. Unfortunately, there's no rail line leaving Fu Chao, so we can't get a good uh, naval connection uh, to the land here. We have to take either uh, Canton or Nanking to get our supply line really solidified. That's going to be tricky. We'll see how that plays out later. Uh, meanwhile, I think that's going to be it for Japan. So we're going to hop back over to the West in Europe. And they're going to do change of governments, which is going to give France one step. And they're going to get to move the colonial unit, as I mentioned, over this away. And the unit in question they're going to bring out will be doo -doo -doo, this guy. And now they're done. And now we go to the U.S. over in the Pacific, and they have another cyan agreement, so they're going to roll it with a minus one DRM from that political roll. Goes to a four. Man, they got boned twice. Chinese inertia, no result. Very disappointing. They're trying to get the Chinese communists and nationalists to agree to work together against Japan. And if they get a one, uh, then that will trigger it. Chinese incident will allow them to put those two into an alliance. And a uh, one or a two would do it. Remember, we have a minus one DRM here. So a two turns into a one. So they had a 33% chance each time. I wonder if they're going to roll their luck marker. I think they would. I think they would use their luck marker here in an attempt to make this happen. So they're going to roll one more time. And they get a three to a two, which allows them to roll on the colonialism table. Not quite what they wanted but maybe it'll give them something good. There's still a very low chance that they get a Chinese incident here if they get a six to a five. So now they're gonna roll on the colonialism table and they got a five to a four, no result, and they wound up wasting their luck marker. But you know what? That's what it's there for. You gotta use it uh, or else uh, it just isn't very good. You know what? The other thing I forgot, we were gonna start with everybody with a, um, a fog of war card. We'll add that in uh, between the next two turns. Uh, meanwhile, the Cyan Agreement is over. I don't think they want to move anything around necessarily right now. They might want to swap these two, but now I'm worried. They might have made a mistake putting that up there. Now we see the buildup in Shanghai. So it's it's too late, though. If they move this guy out, well, it's not too late if they slowly start walking. Can't, can't move the garrison. If they slowly start walking over here, and then next turn they could swap them out and make it a four. That seems like it makes the most sense to me. Um, Although that, of course, threatens Hopei being a better option for Japan next turn to consider. All right. That having been said, the uh, Japanese, sorry, the Western uh, allies here are done. And we're going to go to the Russians over on the TK box. They have nothing to do from this card. They have no real moves to make, so they're done. We go over to the DS card. That's the same thing. That's already done. There's no other elements. In oh, there is somebody actually in the... Uh, delay box, we have the allied luck marker. Now, one of the other changes I'm making to the luck markers with this new rule is instead of sending them to the delay box and then flipping them over and giving them to your opponent, the luck markers here are just going to be a uh, minimum two. So they're going to roll, and even on a one, it would have been a minimum two. So one, two, three, four, five. So they'll get their luck marker back here in uh, late autumn. And that's the end of the spring season. So we're going to end this particular video there, I think. Uh, no, I think we can do the next one. We're going to try to do two seasons a turn. So let's keep going. All right, so we're moving into May, June. And now the Axis has to make a choice. They're getting the government marker back. And they have to decide if they're going to put it on the Navy side or if they're going to put it on the Army side. And this is tricky. Because both of my previous plans were going to be on the Navy side, but now we have a small opportunity. The fact that the nationalist Chinese are still on acceptance and not on the resistance policy means that we can demand Inner Mongolia more safely and avoid any issue of triggering a war with China. 
the problem there is we want our war with China or we want the Navy to be in charge. Those two things have to be. So I don't think we're going to change anything. I think that means that we are going to stay with the government marker having uh, the Navy side face up. All right. So we advanced the time, uh, the, the turn track. Now we're going straight back to Germany. And we start with another uh, seasonal victory check phase. Nothing's changed. So don't have to worry about that. We go to the seasonal phase and the option card segment. We're discarding Goring Works established and we're revealing support nationalists. And before I forget, I'm going to go ahead and put the German rearmament card over there and see what is going to happen here. If there is a civil war country, you may either remove one influence or neutrality marker or roll on any area table. If the result is a neutral or friendly minor country, apply influence to it. We're gonna remove a neutrality marker. And this is where the strategy gets interesting. We're gonna remove the neutrality marker on Switzerland. Why? Just in case, <laughs> we're gonna try. We're gonna try and see if we can get Switzerland without a fight. Um, so support nationalists is then going to give us a step. So we build one more German step and it's going to be an infantry step like, uh, like it always says here. And then we've got to pick our next card. We've done that, but now we have to do German shipbuilding. So we roll for a one and we did not get a German ship. Darn it. All right. Uh, next, we will go on to the political events segment. And this German shipbuilding, by the way, does not have political DRMs. It's always just a straight one to six. But support nationalist does have a political DRM. So a one to a two is a civil war victory for us. That means one, two or three is what we're looking for. But they got a six to a five stalemate. No result. Is this an opportunity where the Germans would like to use their luck card or their luck marker? They're not going to need it here, probably. They might need it here, but that's a ways away. So I think they will. I think they will use their luck marker right now in an attempt to re-roll this. So we're going to go ahead and say, oh, it doesn't have a send to delay box. Oh, I should be able to fix that. Give me a second. All right, fixed. So they're going to send that to the delay box, and then they are going to roll again for supporting nationalists. Come on. Five to a four, roll on the Civil War table. It's another bite at the apple, but it's not as good. A one on the Civil War table is Republican infighting. Ooh, that can be good. So Republican infighting could give the Germans a victory, which would flip one of these Republican markers to its nationalist side. And once all six are on the nationalist side, the nationalists win. Or... They can flip the support marker and say, well, now it's not the communists that are in charge of the Republicans, it's the Democrats. And really the question is, how likely do we think, as the Germans, what do we think of these Russians? Are they going to support their Spanish brethren here in the summer season? Now, obviously, we know that support Republicans was played because we played it. But how likely would a German player predict that? Well, it was the historical opening play. If you look at the historical timeline, that would be what is typically played by many Russian players in that summer season, assuming they can support the Republicans. They don't have a lot else that can fit in that summer that can benefit from the extra role. So I think the German player is going to forego the free win and instead try to basically cancel that card. It really pains me to give up that free win, but I'm going to say that's what that's going to do. So that was the support nationalist card for the Germans. I think they are basically done now. So they are going to pass it off to the Japanese. So the Japanese have to discard their economic program and they're going to reveal food shortages, which just is going to add some stuff to the force pool. Card number one, send a force pool. And it doesn't have, we don't have to roll on this table. This is a bad table. Because we played economic program first, the food shortages don't hurt us that bad. So we don't have to do anything else except we have to do our naval builds. One to three. Damn. Do we want to spend the axis marker here to try to get another naval build? We did get the last one. When's the next one that we might care about? We really are going to care about Demand Hainan. We are going to want to use our role. Actually, we really want to use our role for diplomatic overtures. 
This one we could go either way on. I think we actually want the war with this one. It might be better for us, but it's a tough call. I think we are not going to use our luck to re-roll this naval construction. Because if we did, it could potentially be gone. One, two, three, four, five. It could be gone all the way to January, February. We might need it on the, the winter turns there. The specifically, sorry, yeah, the first winter turn. We might need it on the first winter turn. So we're going to go ahead and uh, play the luck marker. We're just going to let the let the bad roll lie. Then we're going to have to pick the new card. We're picking Demand Hainan. We're sticking with it, even though there's an opportunity there to demand. We need the army leading the government, and that screws everything else up. And so we're going to make that our pending card. Okay. The die has been cast, so to speak. Uh, and now we get no new steps. And we don't have a lot to move around. So it is what it is, I guess. I'm sad that I wound up getting a 0 1, 1 over here instead of a 1, but no well. That's uh, fine. So I think Japan's turn is over. So we're going straight to the Western allies here in Europe. They're going to discard that and flip and reveal Chamberlain diplomacy as Hitler chuckles in the corner. What, what is that fool going to do? I don't know. Uh, but that's going to give the British one step and they're going to get to pick rearmament as their next card. But in the meantime, let's give them their one step. And it probably should be another one, two, two. And it should probably move to Southampton on its turn, uh, just because you really, really, really should have something defending Southampton and something defending London at all times when the war breaks out. So if we put them there now, we won't accidentally forget. Right? Right. Okay. So that is the step that we gained from Chamberlain Diplomacy. Now we're going to get to roll the British ship builds. I'm going to do all the allied ship builds, by the way, for now. So we're going to do British at one to five. No, the British missed a shot. Ooh, is this worth a luck marker? I mean, the British have tons of ships. Do they really need another one? Probably not worth a luck marker. They might want to use the luck marker on the diplomacy roll instead. So here comes the French at one. Nope. And the Americans at one to three. They missed two. Wow. Okay. And then we go on to the political roles here. Remember, this is at a minus one. So a six to a five is conflicting plans, no result. Really a lot of failures in the political game. They don't have the interest in building ships. They can't even get it together for anything here. So that's probably it for the West. Uh, let's go check out the Eastern Western, so to speak and discard the Cyan Agreement and flip this, and a cooling declaration has been played. Get rid of the Chinese mobilization card, and we get to add some stuff to the delay box, specifically here, to the delay box, huh? Yeah. So the Nationalist Chinese have a couple of extra units now that they will eventually get to build, when war breaks out, but we don't know when those are going to come. So the next thing that the Americans must do is choose a new card. And this is where we really have to figure out what the heck the Japanese are thinking here. They're in a position to attack Hopei, and they're lining up over here. It seems likely they're going to demand Inner Mongolia with this setup. And that means we're going to be at war here with Hopei and probably the Nationalists. That having been said, what card can we play that will help us out the most? League of Nations, if Nationalist China is not a pack, receive some steps. So this is one of the only ways to get extra steps to the Chinese beyond the normal. The other option is Chang, Di Chang Diplomacy, which rolls in the strategy board table doesn't have that Chinese incident they're hoping for. What else can they get on the strategy board tape? Military aid would get them to build a step. Japan sports nationalists, obviously bad. Neutrals pressured is a nice thing to get. Hmm. 
Hmm. I like support resistance. It's always nice. But I think they want to go with League of Nations. So they're going to flip League of Nations and put it as the pending card. And then we're going to resolve the rest of Cooling Declaration, which includes a political event segment. So we roll with a minus one. They got a three to a two. Boy, God, the Chinese just can't get their act together over here. I guess Japan's just not looking intimidating enough for them. Uh, next up, we can go with the Soviets, because I don't think the Chinese want to move. Oh, actually, we did want to move this, right? We wanted to do this. And then this, because I'm thinking this is a vulnerability point. We don't want to allow them to have that port on the mainland down there. And at least here, we're kind of blocking them and we're in the mountains, so it's harder for, for them to dislodge us here. So that's a decent spot. And then we've got a pretty strong fortress here in Nanking. Hope will have a decent sized army that'll still probably get plowed through, but the Japanese are only set up with a single step that can actually enter Hope and attack into it. Uh, normally, because I mean, remember, Kwangtung units can't enter Hope, so it will be very difficult for them to take specifically uh, Taiyuan down here. They can maybe take this, but they can't take a freedom uh, very easily. So, and you need to conquer all three cities of Hope in order to conquer it and force the units to be demobilized. So, that's that. Let's go to Russia on the Europe map. Here we are. Tukhachevsky's gone. New current card. Support Republicans. Oh, no. The Chinese, the, the communist Republicans aren't in charge anymore. So, this card is useless for the Russians. The Germans had a very prescient move. Not very prescient. Like I said, this is a very common summer card of 37 because if the Soviets have that marker, then they can do a decent job messing with the German timetable by playing this card in the, in the summer. They don't have a lot else to play on that first year. So uh, unfortunately, all this is going to do is give Russia one step like it normally would, but then it's not going to do anything else. So yeah. That step is, I guess, going to walk over here and then not do anything. And meanwhile, I forgot to move this guy last time. One, two, three, four. And then this time he would go one, two. And now he's guarding, you know, the sort of front line area here. Next, uh, we can consider uh, what else they're going to do on their turn. I don't think they're going to do anything. They do need to pick a new card. And that has political purges pending. So they're done. I think the Russians now just have to roll for their shipbuilding. They did not get shipbuilding. And next we get their eastern part and Mongol purges is gone. New five-year plan is the current card. Uh, they will have something, but we don't know what yet. Uh, can't be pre-war production. Probably border disputes. Like they don't have anything else to play here. So they're just going to play border disputes, unfortunately. And border disputes is a useless card unless the Russians are at war, basically. I think that, yeah, if, if they're at war, then they get to do some stuff. Meanwhile, the new five-year plan requires the Russians to remove one production directorate card. And that is certainly going to be a pain. 36 to 39. So they have to pick... Oops, wrong one. They have to pick one of these to remove. They're either not going to have a Red Navy, not going to have a Red Air Force, not going to have heavy bombers, or not going to have the factory production marker. Boy, I do like that factory production marker, but heavy bombers can be really good too. I think they're going to discard factory production. I mean, I would also discard the Red Navy, except they actually managed to build some stuff. That kind of makes me want to keep it just to see what it can do. Over in Europe, obviously, not over in Vladivostok. They, they, we didn't build that one. Um, ah, no, we'll get rid of Red Navy. It's the one everybody gets rid of. <laughs> I can only do so much different. Um, so that happens here. And then we also have to get rid of the matching Red Navy card over here uh, at the time when um, the five-year plan is played over on the Europe map as well. 
So that's all that happens in that segment. They've picked their next card. They get no steps, but they're going to roll in the political events segment with a minus one. A two to a one is rolling the colonialism table. Colonialism table with a minus one is a strategy board table. Strategy board table with a minus one is allies support resistance. And as far as I can tell, there's precisely one thing that the Soviets can do with this result on the Pacific map. They can't do partisan recruitment because it's not pre, it's still pre-war. They can't really do partisan warfare except in one specific circumstance. There's no minor country units, no multinational units, no colonial units, but there is a single logistics marker that is vulnerable on the map. So they are going to force the Axis to send this Kwangtung logistics marker to the turn track, uh, the delay box rather, and the Kwangtung logistics marker is the only place that Kwangtung steps can be built. So right now they can't be built until that marker comes back. I guess like Japan's like, whatever. I wasn't going to build those anyway, uh, but it is what it is. They they'll take what they can get. And that's probably going to be the end of the Soviet turn, which means that we need to do our delay rolls. So let's open this up. We've got the axis luck marker uh, from, do we have the axis luck marker from Europe? Yes. Cause they re-rolled to get the Civil War result. That's right. So Axis Luck Marker, which is a four. That's good. One, two, three, four. They'll have it for September, October. And then we have on the Pacific side, uh, some of these Chinese units, plus the Soviet, uh, um, Japanese logistics marker. Here's a logistics marker is a two. So they'll get that fairly quickly. Then we get to roll for these uh, Chinese units. There is a three and then a one and a one. Well, that's very concerning. Those are going to come back right away. And then we've got uh, shipbuilding delay rolls. No, nobody got a, got a ship, did they? That's right. Even, uh, even Britain missed on their roll. They rolled a six. The ally, the French and the Americans missed. The Japanese missed. Everybody missed. That's, uh, that's disappointing for everybody. No big, no big boom. Uh, so now we just advance the turn track here. That means that we get a Japanese ship, the Ashigara. That has to be brought in uh, to a Japanese fleet. Right now, I have not organized the Japanese fleets, apparently. That's fine. I'll do so later. We'll just stack it with the other cruisers at the moment. And then we also get to add these to the uh, Allied Force Pool. And then on the European map, there's nothing to add. So we just move into June, July, and we're going to continue on as we have been. June, July, uh, starting with support nationalists, we ignore the stuff in the red box. We just go straight to the political events segment for the, so for the Germans. They're really hoping now to get that Civil War victory they were cheated out of last time. A four to a three. No Parazan. A passer, no Passaran. No Passaran. That result means that the Germans have to lose a step or else suffer a civil war defeat. This is where a, a luck marker would be very valuable. But um, I think they're going to take the step loss because remember, we want to win the civil war as quickly as possible. We can't afford to have this flip against us. I'm sorry, this one would flip against us here. Um, so. That was just unfortunate for the Germans. Next, uh, they're not really going to move anything. Instead, we're going to go straight on to the uh, Japanese. And they've got food shortages, which has nothing going on. And I think we're going to continue to have nothing going on. So let's go right over to the British, who have a Chamberlain diplomacy to roll with a minus one, which is a three. Another no result. It is so insane how often no result comes up, despite the fact that it seems like it should be 50-50 most of the time on these various charts. It's like, it's probably confirmation bias, but it still feels like a lot. So the British aren't moving anything. So now we're going to move on to the Americans over here who do get another Kulang declaration and they're going to roll it. They get a four to a three and they get more Chinese inertia. You see what I'm saying, guys? It's just not working out for the Chinese. I now kind of really, really want to go to war with them because they can't get their act together. They're clearly incompetent. So that's the cooling declaration done. The West doesn't really want to move. I mean, they could move here, but then that puts them further away. If they had to change their mind and move north to guard Changchao against an attack through Hopei, 
they'd be so far away. Instead, they're going to stay here where they're one hex closer. Now, right now, they're one and then two turns away to get back. Sorry, two movements away to get back to Changshao. Uh, I guess that's two turns because of the way this is set up. Um, but they can't they can't be three turns away. That's too many turns away. Uh, so they're going to stay here, put Zox here and here, make it harder for anything invading Fu Chao to go anywhere and do anything. But for now, that's that's where they're going to stay. Okay. So next we go to the Soviets over here, and they again can't support the Republicans because the Republicans are being run by the Democrats now instead, uh, <laughs> by the democracy-loving peoples, I should say. And then over in here, we've got the five-year plan, which is going to roll a die at a minus one. It's a three to a two, which is no result. <laughs> Politics, diplomacy, really slow in this particular game. And then uh, we didn't have anything in the delay box, uh, so we just move on to the next turn of the turn track, which is going to get J uh, J uh, the Japanese back their logistics marker. And we cut back to Germany. This is their last bite at the apple. They really need a Civil War victory here. So they're going to roll the die and get a six to a five as a stalemate. Damn it. All right. Well, it's, Civil War is not, gonna, not going well. I think they're going to have to invade Spain. <laughs> but we'll see how that goes. Next is the Japanese, who we already determined have nothing going on. So we're going to go straight to Chamberlain Diplomacy with a one. Yep. One on one. Rolling the guarantee table. Okay, that could do something. The guarantee table is right here. A three to a two, minor country politics, hello. So minor country politics represents the various minor countries with minds of their own that you can't fully control. And really what we're looking at here is in pre-war, limited war is in effect, the allies are going to have to pick one of the area tables and roll a die if the result yields a minor country or dependent, and it's neutral, which is very, very likely, then the Axis can potentially roll on the diplomatic incident table, which is going to maybe cause that country to join one faction, maybe join the other faction, maybe join one faction, but then attack its neighbor so its neighbor joins the other faction, uh, or that country could go neutral. And the Axis wouldn't mind doing that to a place like Greece, which they're going to have to fight anyway, or a place like Portugal. That's like, what's the worst that could happen? Portugal goes allies, and then the green hex stays under allied control. We don't care. So if the Germans can cause that to happen on a country that doesn't have a gray hex in it, they will probably try to risk the role. But they don't want to risk the role on Italy or Austria, or Czechoslovakia, or Hungary. So I think the central table is what the allies will roll on. And they got a one, which is a setback, no result. So no, no choice anyway. So there's your Chamberlain diplomacy, again, resulting in a no result. <laughs> Meanwhile, over here, the cooling, de cooling declaration may now actually do something. It does. Uh, technically, they had to choose a Chinese country before doing this. Do they want to use it on Hopei? Probably not. Right now, Japan's looking like they're going to attack Hopei and then use it as an incentive to go to war with the nationalists down here, right? That's the only reason to stack up in Shanghai. So uh, they probably don't need to put a, a Western influence here. If the Soviets could put a Soviet influence here, it could really mess with that plan. But if the Allies try to activate Hopei, it could just wind up being useless, right? If this thing activates due to an attack, then that influence is wasted. So I think that the Nationalists are going to activate Yunnan, because Yunnan is very well defended down here in the bosom of China. It's probably never been described that way. Um, but... Uh, that just seems like the place that makes the most sense at the moment for these guys. If they can get influence here again, then they will activate Yunnan as an allied Chinese country, as a nationalist Chinese country. And then Yunnan can provide their not insignificant forces. I mean, Yunnan has an expeditionary unit that's a 111 port a fort It can flip over to a fort side, and it's got a couple of extra units here that it could uh, also lend to the battle. It's the same size as Sichuan and Hopei. They are all the same size. The nationalists from Kiangsu is a, are a little bit bigger. Anyway, 
finally had a successful result on one of these cards. The Soviets, again, can't support the Republicans. Those are, I mean, I, th- I still think it was probably the right move for the Germans to uh, turn down the free Civil War victory in order to cancel this card because the Soviets might have been getting their own Civil War victory. So probably still the right move to have screwed that up. Uh, the Soviets are also usually in a position to play more of those support Republican cards than the West is. The West has a bunch of cards they want to play. The Soviets, not so much. They don't mind throwing that support Republicans in all the time. So now the fact that they've changed sides is really problematic for the allies. All right. That having been said, over in the uh, Eastern side, we do have a roll for new five-year plan. Here's the roll. It's a six to a five. (laughs) No result. Are you surprised? I'm not surprised. Let's check the delay boxes, shall we? Uh, We got nothing here in this delay box. We got nothing here in this delay box. So we advance the turn marker and we get one new unit being added to the force pool for the nationalist Chinese. And that's going to do it for this episode, ladies and gentlemen. We kept it under two hours. Hell yeah. Whew, that was tiring. All right. We'll see you next time. If you have any questions or if you spotted any issues, please let me know and we will attempt to fix them next time on Axis Empires. Have a good one.